Hello, welcome to Defense Against the Dark Arts. I'm Paul Mill, and this is episode 26, Persuasion and Manipulation. We've been talking about this whole thing the whole time, but I'm going to be a little more specific in this one. So now we are at the heart of the beast. Non-rational persuasion is not reasoning. I'm going to say that again. Non-rational means irrational persuasion persuasion without using reason is not or persuasion that is not rational is not reasoning (laughs) it seems pretty obvious so we have left the realm of simple arguments and entered the world of pure manipulation we know about fallacious appeals to emotion but just think about fallacious appeals to imagination now someone else creates an image for you to imagine someone else creates you know imagery that you can picture in your mind then they can distort and pervert it to suit their agenda that is getting into your head right so that is not reasoning that is manipulation when reasons alone are not good enough to persuade others to agree with a point or to conform your behavior to someone else's wishes, reason may need to be dressed up. It may need to be made appealing before it has the desired effect on the target. Appeals to irrationality are compounded in effect when they are layered together in a single attack. Appeals to emotion imagination, colorful imagery, half-truths, the gamut. So it's not just the appearance of truth, it's manipulation of the target's frame of mind to make them susceptible to suggestion, to the point where the target wants to believe the manipulator's claims. To get a target to want what the manipulator desires is brainwashing, period. One powerful technique is self-regulation, where the target is primed to feed the monster. This is a self-reinforcing feedback loop which conditions the target even when the outside stimulus is removed, like how dolphins are trained to do things that they naturally would do in the wild, but on command for some tasty fish. The dolphins are big-brained, intelligent creatures, and they can be conditioned. We too can be conditioned like the dolphins with our big brains. Our tendencies and susceptible flaws are amplified. And one of these flaws is feeding the monster. If you haven't heard my podcast on feeding the monster, you need to go back to my website at miil.ca to find it and watch it. Feeding the monster is when we mentally feed back and and repeat criticism or, or desire about someone or something and allow our emotions to get involved. At that point, we are no longer rationally reviewing or thinking about something. We are in a feedback loop of hate or desire. This is how, you know, we become obsessed over something or someone. This is how we get gear acquisition syndrome. This is how our hate and desire grows. This is how advertising works and how celebrity works, right? Why do, why do we care about, I don't care, you know, celebrities, those who pine over them because they've been thinking about them because they've been having them jammed in their face. So it starts occupying their mind. The power of suggestion with repetition absolutely works on our wants and hates. Repeat a lie loud enough and long enough and people will begin to believe it. We can do this to ourselves organically, or it can be triggered by an inconsequential random event or by external nefarious triggers or actors. (laughs) The solution is to let the brief wave of emotion pass and then let it go. Do not fixate on something. If, If a trigger is shown and then the desired hate or want is reinforced artificially, we call that propaganda. External forces are trying to get into your head and make you want to hate something or desire something. 
It's a powerful tool to sow division if you want to weaken a society before changing it or taking it over. Divide and conquer. This is something we can do to ourselves naturally if we're not careful. I would guess that this character trait developed due to evolution for us to find mates and tolerate them long enough to have offspring. If you find you're getting yourself worked up and obsessed over, obsessing over something, stop. It's that simple. Realize you are feeding the monster and then let it go, like releasing a fish back to the sea. I think feeding the monster and phobias may also have something to do with addiction. So, manipulators can foster monsters before injecting them into their target's minds as fear, hate, or desire. Simply create a scenario or a narrative, create the monster based on primal instincts, and then broadcast it like a virus and keep repeating it like a beacon of hate or desire or fear. Those of us who think they cannot be fooled are the easiest prey, with the bonus that once we're fooled, we refuse to believe it. So all persuasion is not bad. Persuasion by reason is, of course, good. There are some manipulators who say you don't know what's good for you. Uh, you know, you're the ignorant little people. You need to be led by a centralized group of superiors, your superiors. You know, what makes them so special? What makes them their, your superior? Nothing, because they aren't, right? In fact, in all probability, they are failed human beings. Money and power does not make one a successful human being, as we all know. To the contrary, those who have attained vast money and power clearly have a deep character flaw to the point of being abnormal because they are not normal. They're not average, right? The old metaphor of selling your soul for wealth and power is an accurate one. There may not have been a deal with the devil, but that which made them a valid human being is no longer or never was there. Does vast money make one a failed human being? Or does being a failed human being allow one the actions to bring about vast money and power? <laughs> or is there some other cause to, the, to their effects? Or is there no correlation? Or is the 1% a failed human being by definition? Yes, we all instinctively want sufficient resources and power to secure our survival, like all wild animals. But the levels attained by Bill Gates and George Soros is well beyond what is sufficient for a comfortable existence. They appear to have aspirations for dominion over humanity, and that character flaw has given them the resources to do it. So don't feed the monster. Don't be a naive idiot either. Take control of your mind. <laughs> if you don't control your thoughts, someone else will. The concepts of literal uh, interpretations and natural interpretations are also a great thing to understand. When there's more than one way to interpret a statement, a manipulator may have intentionally made it so in order to deceive the target. They may have said something that is literally true, but when interpreted naturally, the way 99% do 99% of the time, the statement is misleading. This reprehensible skill is used when the manipulator does not want to be caught in a lie, but still has the desire to persuade and manipulate a target audience. For example, politicians, advertisements, and law. We must resist the urge to become emotional when we know we are being lied to or manipulated. Emotion fogs your reason. Emotion is like a drug that makes your reason vague. Tic Tacs come to mind. I don't know. You know, chemically they are 94.5% sugar and yet they advertise as sugar free. Well, how? The FDA says that as long as there's less than 0.5 grams of sugar per serving, anyone can advertise that as sugar free. So Tic Tacs advertising is a deceptive lie. They are using the literal interpretation of the rules and in, in advertising, knowing 
the consumers are going to use the natural interpretation of the words. I don't know if the FDA is complicit in this deception, but if they had half a brain in their head, they would say instead of 0.5 grams of sugar per serving, they would say less than 0.5% sugar by mass per serving. Objectively, you know, uh, well, using objective reality, Tic Tacs are sugar pills. Claiming anything else is deceptive and reprehensible. I don't care how you try to justify it. Misusing natural interpretations versus literal interpretations, especially some of arbitrary guidelines or laws, is a valuable tool for the manipulator. The truth can mislead and falsity can be truth depending on the interpretation. This Orwellian doublespeak is true in the proper context. The, the apparent fallacy is because we interpret things naturally and not by literal truth most of the time. An example of falsity being true because of how we naturally interpret things is this example. <laughs> Can we put bananas in the fridge? The correct natural answer is no. They will turn brown faster. But that is false by a literal interpretation because you physically can put bananas in the fridge. But the natural interpretation includes the implied meaning. Is this the best way to store bananas? That's the implicit, the implied question. So the literal question is not the, the implied question. So the natural interpretation includes the implied question. The question wasn't intended to be interpreted literally, and most people would not interpret it literally unless you're a smart ass, right? We've all done it, right? Manipulators interact with real humans, so they are well aware of the natural interpretations of statements. So when they choose to mean the literal interpretation, when they know a normal person would interpret it naturally, they are intentionally attempting to deceive and are therefore liars who should never be trusted. So when a politician uses the manipulative tools of rhetoric daily for years, how is anyone expected to trust them during an emergency such as a pandemic, especially when they give non-answers and change the official story and somehow add that the nation is racist because of it, right? Along with the literal interpretation shtick is the incomplete sentence shtick. Remember back in grade five when Mrs. Dyko, and that was my grade five teacher's name, told you that a sentence has two parts, a subject and what the subject is doing. If you are missing either one of those, it is not a sentence. I am is a sentence. The subject is I, and what the subject is doing is amming. I'm existing. I'm doing, you know, I'm existing. So 50% less is not a sentence. There is no subject. What's 50% less? 50% less of what? Less than what? You know, it, it's literally meaningless crap that is written literally. <laughs> so it's, 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 they do this so as not to be sued, you know, because the law takes literal interpretations. 50% less sugar. That's not a sentence. It, and it's ambiguous. Is it less sugar per portion because the portion sizes are cut in half, which would mean there's actually a zero reduction in sugar? Manipulators have no solicitude to their targets. Solicitude means care or concern. They should have, but they obviously don't. You know, solicitude is not to be confused with solicitation. <laughs> so now we come to weasel words, also called modal terms and verb helpers or helping verbs. I can't remember which. So I touched on this earlier in a different episode. Weasel words are could, must, would, should, can, might. Weasel words are used to hedge a claim. All non-deductive claims should have weasel words as non-deductive claims can never prove anything. They can at best just claim the most likely or the best current guess. Recall that science is non-deductive logic. And I'm not being anti-science, I'm just stating fact. So, Without these weasel words added to non-deductive claims, the claims would be in error. And we hear this a lot. Uh, 
And they go, well, you know what I meant, going back to, you know, natural interpretation. No, <laughs> you're dealing with science. You should be using the literal interpretation when you're describing something as, you know, as accurately as you can. When a counterexample is used to refute a generalization, the only defense the arguer has is to weaken the claim by introducing weasel words, which, depending on the situation, may make the argument pointless or meaningless. Weasel words compound the meaningless with each weasel word that's added to the claim. For example, secondhand tobacco smoke can be a possible risk to some people with chronic illness. Can be possible risk some people. The statement is not claiming that it is a risk or that it is even a possible risk. The statement is claiming that it can be a possible risk, <laughs> right? So the claim is so weak that it is literally meaningless. The uncertainties are mul multiplied with each addition of a weasel word. The natural interpretation is that it sounds bad, but the literal interpretation, you know, legally, is not saying that it's that much of a risk at all. I talked about emotional appeals earlier on, and uh, this one's easy. Every single time there is an emotional appeal, it is manipulation. <laughs> emotional overtones bypass our reasoning. Why would a manipulator use emotional appeals? Well, there is no rational argument, right? So then they have to use emotion. They disguise it with a, th their lack of reason with emotional content. Emotional appeals are commonly seen in propaganda by the political establishment, in documentaries, and incendiary news. All intended to get an emotional response and not a rational one. If it's just a story and you hear it and it's, oh, that's not so bad, but they throw this emotion and, and error and, you know, then you're going to start getting worked up and you're going to click on it or you're going to read it, right? It's all clickbait or maybe worse. There is a, a bizarre opposite to emotional appeals, it, which you would think is probably good news, right? But it's not, you know, they're de-emotional appeals. I don't think that's the word, but they try to get us unemotional about things you know, we would naturally be emotional about. For example, they try to extinguish the concept of mother and replace her with birthing person, as well as attacking the concept of family, especially one that has a father, mother, and a child of children, and replace it with some emotionless communist unit of production zones or surplus population. Yes, I said emotions block your reason, but that doesn't mean there's no place for emotions in life. We all have, you know, uh, common sense here. So it's not that emotions are all bad, but emotions, emotions can be used to manipulate you if they're pushed, right? So I'm not saying emotions are bad, but when they also, you have natural emotions and they're trying to remove them, this is also bad, right? Other forms of de-emotional appeals would be euphemisms. They're meant to reduce the emotional impact. For example, killing of innocents is called collateral damage. Instead of indoctrination, you know, we, we call it university. <laughs> you know, when they, when they, they'll say team building, instead of calling the team a bunch of losers, instead of calling somebody incompetent, we say they're struggling. You know, reality is offensive to some. So the euphemisms of a thing that are undesirable become offensive. And so those euphemisms are changed until those become offensive ad nauseum, you know, or we could just accept the reality, you know, and a thing is what a thing is. Emotional appeals can also be uh, an emotional gain of function. Uh, this is when they're used to amplify emotions. When you're already sort of something that's a little emotion, they amplify them. So this is a, a gain of function, right? They're amping up your emotions, you know, where they're not warranted. So emotional appeals can create emotions where there would be none. They can amplify natural emotional responses to unnatural levels or suppress natural emotional responses or bury the undesirable in a bed of euphemism. So we don't have to face their existence. So executive summary, the argument alone must carry the weight of persuasion. Evaluate claims rationally 
Do not allow appeals to distract you. I mean, like any kind of emotional appeals or any kind of appeals, fallacious appeals. Ignore parenthetical elements. Now, a parenthetical element is something like I believe or I think or obviously or I'm afraid that. You can just cross them out. That is crap. It's subjective. And subjective crap is always in need of revision. We have enough on our plates, you know, holding our own subjective perspectives against objective reality. We don't need the added hassle of having to compare someone else's subjective reality against objective reality. But we kind of have to in order to sieve out, sieve out, sieve out, sieve out, filter out the crap from the truth. So now we have reported arguments. So hearsay, straw man, misreporting, disreporting, exaggerating, phantom connections, appeals to emotion, assertions. It's rare that a report does not distort the truth in some way. Legacy news does not even bother reporting. They just make assertions. They are the propaganda wing of the political establishment. Legacy news should argue, explain, and report, but they mostly assert. This brings me to holistic analysis. It's important to read something in its entirety before judging the context. Holistic is not an intrinsically bad word, as any fans of Douglas Adams would tell you. Bart, the holistic assassin. (laughs) So I think uh, that's it for this one. I'm going to maybe, we'll see what I do in the next one. I might do PSYOPs. I don't know. Anyways, I'm done.